Aloha and welcome to Live at the Legislature, where every week we sit down with members of the House of Representatives to talk about issues, legislation, and some hot gossip running through the halls of the state capitol. I don't think we've ever mentioned it before, but we shoot the show here in the chambers of the House and Senate. This morning we are in the gallery of the House chambers, where there are 51 members. 17 of them are women, and we could use a little bit more. Joining me this morning is Representative Linda Ichiyama. She is the co-convener of the Women's Legislative Caucus. Before we begin talking about the, the package of legislation that the caucus has introduced this year, let's talk a little bit about the caucus. When was it formed? Why was it formed? Why do we need it? Thank you for having me, Carolyn. Good morning. Good morning. So it was formed about 30 years ago, and one of the stories that I loved hearing is how it was originally started by our now Senator Maisie Hirono when she was in the House of Representatives. And she and her colleagues got together and said, we should have a women's caucus. It was one of the first in the nation. Nobody had ever done it before, especially in Hawaii. And uh, the male members at the time told them, no, it's okay. Just put in your bills with everybody else's. And she tells a story, and she kind of like throws her hair back and says, but we did it anyway. Good for her. Is, good for you. Yes, yes, which is a good thing for all of us. So let's talk about um, um, the package this year. Uh, what are the key or priority bills that we're taking a look at? So we have a number of priorities in our caucus package. Uh, one of them is violence against women. We have a number of bills that deal with domestic violence. One, for example, would reduce the number of unnecessary uh, delays in the TRO or temporary restraining order process, mm -hmm. which is so often the first steps that a victim will take in order to protect herself and her family. Another issue that we're looking at is violence against women in the workplace and equality in the workplace. So we're looking at making our employment discrimination laws apply not only to employees but also to interns, which we know are often pe young people just starting in the workplace and often more vulnerable to harassment. So I noticed that the, the issues have been like violence against women, um, workplace um, abuse. Is that is that seems to have been the issues you've been tackling for at least the past five years? Yes. And I think that's reflective of the priorities of the members of the caucus. We're a bipartisan group of female legislators, both the House and Senate, and every year we vote on the priority bills that make it into the caucus. We only are allowed 10 bills in our caucus package, mm -hmm. and the bills also need to get 75% support of the caucus members. So it's a pretty high threshold. So do you, I see, so do you all, um have, have a say in what you would like to see in the package? Exactly. So members as well as the Women's Coalition submit bills for consideration and then it's the members of the caucus that vote on it. Well, since the caucus was formed back in the 1980s and here we are in 2020 um, and you're, you know, I know you're, you're young, you've only been here just a short time in your life, but have you noticed any difference? I mean, is there movement being made? I think so. I think it's, it's painfully slow, uh, but we are making progress. And one of the great things about being a co-convener is I get to look at the history of what the caucus has done. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, roughly about 20 years ago, in the early 2000s, we passed a law that allowed public breastfeeding. And now in this day and age, we don't think twice if a mother has to feed her child when she's grocery shopping or at the mall, and we take it for granted. But in that day, there were op-eds. There was a lot of opposition to allowing women to breastfeed in public. Are you, are you seeing that kind of reaction, or have you seen that kind of reaction um, to bills that we've been taking a look at, say, for the last five years? You know, I think that is a reflection so the answer is no, not as much. And I think that's a reflection of how our society has changed and evolved. Mm -hmm. I still think, though, there's a lot of work for us to do. This year, we're actually celebrating the 100th anniversary of the women's right to vote. But as you mentioned, women make up roughly about one third of the entire legislature when we are more than half of the voting population. So there's still a lot of work to do, especially when it comes to women in government. Are there, I think there, there are a couple of, I believe, resolutions or maybe even a bill in this year's package that sort of addresses um, the issue of access for women to 
get on boards and commissions or things like that. Yes, exactly. So often uh, w the way that women get involved in politics is first by starting to volunteer for one of our boards or commissions. And so we have a resolution this year to ask both the legislature as well as the executive branch, because the governor makes appointments as well to these boards and commissions, and to state judge uh, positions mm -hmm. to look for more gender equity and parity. And so we've asked our boards and commissions office to say uh, how many uh, female members are there versus male members and how can we get more women to apply to those positions. I, I see, you know, your package is legislation. Can we legislate our way to equality? Or is there something more, something that government can't do, that we have to change ourselves? Sure. So I always tell people you can't legislate common sense. And okay. I sometimes feel like it, when we're talking about equality, it should be common sense. Um, but I think that, you know, sometimes in order for society to evolve, we need to have policy changes. Mm -hmm. And so that's some of the things that we're taking a look at this year. What would you like to see the number of, we've, as I said, 51 members, 17 women. What would you like to see the, the, the female number grow to? Well, I would love for us to be like some of the legislatures on the mainland where there are more women than men. If we have that happening on our county council levels, um, for example, on Maui, there are more female county council members than men. And I think that uh, the more that we encourage women to get involved in government and politics, the better. Okay. We've got about a minute or so left. So l let's talk a little bit specifically. Are there, is there a particular bill or two in this package that you personally feel strongly about or is, is more of a priority for you personally than the other bills in the package? One of the bills I've been working on personally is a bill to address commercial sexual exploitation of children or child sex trafficking. We really haven't had a statewide policy discussion about how to address this issue. And a recent study by Child and Family Services revealed that one in four of their clients had experienced trafficking at some time in their lives. So we know that it's happening in Hawaii, and I think that we need to elevate it and the level of discussion so that we can address it better. Well, great. Is there anything that I've left out asking you that you'd like to focus on? I'd love to invite people to testify and submit comments on our legislative package. They can find out more on our Facebook page. We have a Hawaii Women's Legislative Caucus Facebook page, or they can use the Capitol website and track it by uh, the keyword search. Okay, great. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. I mean, it, we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the year to women's right to vote. We'll see uh, how much further we can get along before I am okay. <laughs> thank you for joining us, and thank you for joining us for Live at the Legislature. We will see you again next week. Aloha. What are you doing? We have to go. I'm gonna be late for work. It's Tuesday morning. I gotta record live at the legislature on Alelo. Senate and House leadership discussing what's happening at the state capitol. So just watch it on the news tonight. Come on, let's go. Hey, this is like getting the news before it's news. If only I could get this remote to work. There. Can we go now? No DVR? No problem. Watch Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. on Channel 49. Every year, thousands of children go missing in Hawaii. Sometimes they're taken by a stranger or a family member. Sometimes they become lost, run away, or even forced out of their homes into danger on the streets. Aloha, I'm Amanda Leonard with the Missing Child Center Hawaii. We are a program within the Department of the Attorney General, and our mission is to protect missing and exploited children by using every possible resource to locate, recover, and reunite them with their families and caregivers. The consequences for missing children and their families are devastating. Educating yourself and your children about child safety, including what they share online, is their best protection against abduction and exploitation. If your child is missing or if you have information on a missing child, please contact us. Please also visit our webpage for more information on our services, our Keiki ID program, and a list of Hawaii's missing children so that you can help us bring them home. Mahalo.
Aloha and welcome back to Live at the Legislature for our weekly Sen Senate segment. I'm the Senate Communications Director, Jesse Broder Van Dyke, and our guest this week is Senator Stanley Chang, who represents Hawaii Kai all the way to Diamond Head. Thanks for being here this week, Senator Chang. Thanks for having me, Jesse. Uh, today you've got an important hearing and decision-making meeting about uh, the housing package, which is in the joint legislative package, which uh, they spoke about a little bit in the last segment. Can you tell us about what's going on today? Yeah, so the House and the Senate have been working on this extremely ambitious package um, over the last four months or so. We've gotten to the point where we have language um, because of some of the innovative ideas, because we're breaking the mold on some of the issues. You know, the language is not perfect, so we've made some pretty extensive amendments and we're still talking about them, and this afternoon we'll have a chance to present them. So we want to really address one of the critical issues of affordability. I don't think that housing that's affordable to folks at 140% of AMI, families that are making um, over $168,000 a year for a family of four, um, and a unit that costs $867,000, I don't think that's gonna be affordable to anyone, which is why uh, I believe that we need to lower those numbers or at least provide some standard so that real working people have a chance. That's just one of the many amendments we'll be looking at. So you and the other committee chairs and the House and Senate leadership worked on this uh, package of bills over the recess, and I understand this is the first time maybe in a couple decades that the governor and both houses have been on board. And last year there was a number of measures that ended up dying because the two chambers didn't come to an agreement. Can you tell us a little bit about this effort and how this all came together? So I've only been in the Senate since 2016, but this is certainly the first time that I've seen high-level meetings between the House and the Senate, even before session started. And just to talk about the housing aspect, Senator Schatz, um, United States Senator Schatz, was actually very active in convening the state level, the county levels, um, both the legislative and executive branches to come together and really bring forward all the ideas that we had to end the housing shortage, to move the needle in a politically realistic way. And so while no, not everyone's idea made it, and certainly um, not all of my ideas are in the package, I think it's really quite a departure from precedent that we are all actually you know, talking and actually hashing out these tough issues instead of waiting till the very end of session in conference. And this was inspired by the reality that it's very difficult for local families to remain in Hawaii. And in fact, we've had population decline in recent years because it's so difficult for people to own a home and make ends meet. So tell us a little bit about how this package is going to help people in those situations. Yeah. Well, I think the centerpiece of the package is um, the 99-year lease idea. If you've heard in the paper or in the news over the last couple of years, we've been talking a lot about the Singapore model of public housing, and that entails the state building um, condos on state-owned lands near rail stations, selling 99-year leases on them at a very low price, maybe as low as $300,000 a piece, to Hawaii residents who would be owner-occupants and own no other real property, with a number of other conditions, but um, in this nation of Singapore, we have 82% of the population living public housing. It's clean, it's well-maintained, and it sells for only $180,000 for a brand new unit. And it's a great model for us, and we're hoping to adopt some of the elements that we can, understanding that, of course, Hawaii is a very different place from Singapore, um, but I think it's a model that we really need to embark on because it's one of the very few in the world that has actually ended a housing shortage. So explain to me how the 99-year lease works versus the state just selling the land fee simple. So it's very difficult for the state to sell the fee simple interest in lands, and we certainly are not advocating for that. But what a 99-year lease does is it takes you to the end of your natural life. You can buy that unit with the confidence that you will never have to move again before you die, that the landlord will never sell the house or will never raise the rent in an unreasonable way. Um, and that's security. And that's what I think people are really looking for when they're looking to buy a property. Shifting subjects a little bit to your district, I know you recently sent home a mailer to all of your constituents asking them what issues are affecting their community and uh, what was the result of that? 
So speaking of housing, Jesse, the number one issue overwhelmingly by a two to one margin was homelessness. And um, people don't typically think of East Honolulu as a real hotspot for homelessness, but the reality is, you know, I live in Wailai Kahala and I see homeless people every single day. And that's true in Hawaii Kai, that's true in Diamond Head where there's a long time homeless population. And we all are deeply impacted by it. And that's why I think injecting a huge amount of affordable housing inventory into Hawaii is really the single most important priority that we have as a state. It seems like every year, you know, the, the state and the city have done so much to help homeless individuals, but every year there are more. And it really comes down to the housing shortage. Yeah, you know, um, the median home price uh, on Oahu is well over $800,000 at this point. I met a homeless family recently in Kapiolani Park. They were living in their van, mom and a dad and a nine-year-old daughter. Both parents worked, actually the dad worked two jobs, and they just couldn't make rent, the minimum wage being what it is. Um, and that's the reality of living in Hawaii today. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, Jesse, because the, the real crisis, in my opinion, is all the people you don't see on the streets, our young people, our future generations who have moved to the mainland or overseas because they just can't make it here in Hawaii. Or they're living multiple generations in a single home. Exactly. Uh, your district stretches all the way from Hawaii Kai to Diamond Head, and inside of your district was the terrible incident that happened a few weeks ago on Hibiscus Drive where we lost two police officers, where the suspect was a mentally ill individual who had been contacted a number of times but refused to get treatment. That seems to be a big problem where individuals who refuse treatment uh, continue to uh, cause problems to their community and themselves. What can we do about that problem? Yeah, that's a really tough issue. and. Um, it's not easy because, you know, people who refuse to receive treatment in this country, we have freedom and it's very difficult for the government to compel people to receive treatment. I'm really encouraged that there are a number of bills that are on the table. This session last year there was a community assisted treatment program for a lot of our homeless individuals. Um, another one of the initiatives that I'm really excited about this session is to increase the number of uh, therapists and psychologists at the University of Hawaii campuses in this age of mass shootings, of suicides. I think it's really important that our young young people um, who may have mental health issues have access in a really easy and ready way to, um, to mental health therapists. Well, thank you for that, and that's uh, an effort I know a lot of people in the legislature and our community are working on. Thank you so much. So this afternoon you have your hearing and decision making uh, in your housing committee. That's going to be uh, this afternoon. It's going to be live on Alelo. People can tune in. and. Um, uh, any, any further uh, information about that hearing? Yeah, so we'll be doing our de decision making not only on that joint package bill, but we'll also be um, doing our Aloha Homes package, which is a real, a very w fleshed out, uh, comprehensive package. I tell people Aloha Homes are affordable housing plan based on the Singapore model. It's not like a fruit salad where you just pick the mangoes mm -hmm. and the kiwis and the cherries and then leave the rest, um, or your favorites. You know, it's, it's like a Jenga tower. You, you remove one element and the whole tower could come crashing down. And, and we don't know what that element is, um, but hopefully it will serve as a guide to the agencies and to the state as we roll out a really well thought out affordable housing plan. Well, thank you so much for being here today and good luck with your hearing and decision making this afternoon. And uh, this episode will re replay uh, this Wednesday at 7 p.m. and we'll be, be back here next week, Tuesday morning, for another episode of Live at the Legislature. Thanks so much, Senator Chang. Thanks thank for you for watching. You. Your government needs you. The Hawaii State Legislature is encouraging citizens to get informed and involved. With thousands of bills introduced every year, it can be hard to keep up on the issues that matter most to you. Located on the fourth floor of the state capitol, the public access room is filled with knowledgeable and friendly staff to help you. This is your Hawaii, your state capitol. Get informed, get involved, and get the government you want. Pacific people have the power to shape our own future and contribute to a greater cause. The 2020 census is coming soon. It's a population count that happens every 10 years. It recognizes everyone in your home. Including children of all ages. It informs how billions of dollars in public funding are spent each year. It's confidential. 
You can respond online, by phone, or by mail. It's our right to be counted. Shape our future, start here. Paid for by U.S. Census Bureau. Aloha and welcome back to Live at the Legislature, where every week we sit down with reps and senators from the legislative minority to talk about issues running through the state capitol. Joining us today is Representative Gene Ward. He is the minority leader representing District 17, Hawaii Kai and Kalama Valley, and he sits on the committees on health and water, land, and Hawaiian affairs, which will be uh, our segment for today. We'll split it into based on uh, these two committees that you're on. So we'll start off with health. Um, <coughs> uh, this week, because of coughing like that, <laughs> We should assure people that the coronavirus is being taken care of. There's no worry to be concerned about it. Uh, the lieutenant governor has given a briefing. 27 people are in quarantine. Only one actually from Hawaii who actually possibly contracted. The other are voluntary. So those of you who are alive, those who are listed, looking live at the legislature, be assured everything is under control. But otherwise, we have the um, Red Hill fuel tank issue that we're going to be hearing as we speak, actually. So going to back to coronavirus, I think you, had, you were in the news last week um, right after a tweet in one of the hearings after, uh, <laughs> after the info briefing. So tell us a little bit about that and then, I guess, the progress from the hearing that you were in to, I guess, to what you had mentioned about the lieutenant governor. Well, you know how fast information travels. Basically, it was in the health committee hearing where Bruce Anderson front-loaded, interrupted himself and said, oh, by the way, we've got two Chinese at the airport who have been seeking asylum. And immediately I thought, well, is it biological or is it ideological? As you know, we in Hawaii are probably the biggest asylum destination for Chinese uh, nationals, which I didn't realize, but now it was because of probably the biological, maybe with a combination with the ideological, and as we speak, we still don't know what it is, but they are in the detention center, which suggests possibly maybe more uh, political than otherwise. So I tweeted that out, as, as I do with a lot of important issues. People picked it up and the media was calling me like, hey, I'm not an, a go-to guy with CDC credentials from Atlanta, Georgia. But it's where people didn't know and then appreciated to be kind of apprised of what was going on because we have been designated as one of the seven, now one is the 11. And I push back on that because I think with 50% of our visitor industry as the solution for our economy, our economy is based upon 50% of all the visitors that come here, 10 point something million. Uh, we can't afford to have a crisis. We can't afford to have, hey, don't go to Hawaii, they got coronavirus. So my sense was, and I pushed back at the White House as well as the RNC, get Hawaii off the list. By then, all the water had gone under the dam. We were one, and strategically, yes, we're in the Pacific, but because our, our economy is so fragile, um, we have to be very careful, and I just wanted to ensure people are starting out. The coronavirus is under control, and if anything does happen, I'll be sure to tweet out uh, what uh, differences or what uh, developments may occur. Again, this is not to, not to worry the folks at home who are watching, yeah. but you, you did have a direct role to play in, um, I think, the, the quarantine status. So can you talk about that? You mentioned the White House, RNC, yeah, Well, Well, there, <clears throat> there was a difficulty getting the approval for the Pearl Harbor base, and that approval was stuck for two days. And Josh and I are friends from when he was in the House, and we kept in touch with each other. And I said, Josh, you need any help with this? And I said, because I'm the National Committee man, I can call the White House, I can go through the RNC, which I did do. And unfortunately, they were saying a lot of the private sector is the issue that they're using on the mainland for a lot of things. I said, don't you dare think about putting any of our people in quarantine in Waikiki. That's exactly the wrong thing that we want to do. So a couple of hours after that, Josh called and said, hey, everything's working well. Now, whether there's a correlation with my call or whatnot, we can't really show or tell. But the fact is, we do have that place with 60 rooms, 120 beds, and we, ha we are prepared for anything uh, that occurs. And right now, there are 26 beds for those who have voluntarily quarantined themselves. So again, rest assured, everything is under control. 
We're going to switch gears to the Hawaiian issue. So My it, favorite subject. It is Hawaiian Caucus mm -hmm. Week here at the State Capitol. Uh, February is uh, Olelo Hawaii Month as well. So. Uh, you had, a, it, they kicked it off yesterday with uh, House Concurrent Resolution 37, which would call the governor to uh, form a, a reconciliation task force. <clears throat> it was in the auditorium, uh, quite a decent amount of people there. Can you talk about the... Uh, first, a disclaimer. Uh, I am not Hawaiian, but I have enough credentials to be able to stand and speak, I think, with to some degree of certainty, truth, and honesty about the Hawaiian situation. For five years, I studied Hawaiian affairs. I have a PhD in economic sociology, having studied Hawaiians in comparison to uh, Caucasians. Uh, secondly, for 12 years, I was the business partner with Dr. George Kanahele, one of the premier civic leaders, intellectual thought leaders in the Hawaiian community. We were doing entrepreneur training of Hawaiians and of indigenous people in 10 countries all over the world. And I'll never forget the first thing he said to most every indigenous group. He said, first thing you got to do is exorcise the spirit of inferiority or the ghost of inferiority so you too can take a stand in this economic leadership that your country needs you to do. And I, I had that same sense yesterday in the, in the hearing. Uh, unfortunately, the, the reconciliation got too focused on TMT. And really the focus, and I think my remarks at the end of it were about, this is about 135 years of anger, disappointment, and broken promises. And you know my issue is the DHHL, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, which 100 years ago, this is a, another reason why this should be Hawaiian Week or Hawaiian Caucus Week. 100 years ago, Prince Goheel had the Department of Hawaiian Homelands or the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act passed and now, 100 years later, after they got 203,000 acres, they have 9,800 people on the, on the, actually having a homestead. 28,000 on the wait list. One of the testifiers yesterday in the hearing said, you guys know what to do. The government knows what to do. The governor knows what to do, and we're not doing it. And I think that was one of the takeaways. The distrust of government from the Hawaiian community. Every community that's come to Hawaii has prospered, except the host community, the Hawaiian community. When it comes to protocol, dancing, and uh, chanting, and culture, and all the uh, efforts, Hawaiians get preeminence. When it comes to political and economic issues, they get in the back seat and they say, well, wait, we're not ready for that yet. I think Anyways, that, that's just, that's my opening remarks. <laughs> that, that, that's an issue that we haven't paid attention to, and this body keeps kicking the can down the road. We got about 45 seconds left. I think that was a big thing in the hearing. Is I think the lack of excitement behind this this big task force to reconcile the Hawaiian community. You had me on my uh, calendar from nine to three o'clock, and it was finished by 10:30. Uh, suddenly it was kind of a non-event, but it was an event where a lot of people said they don't trust Governor Ige. Do you see that, that do you see that changing, that the excitement around it, do you see the ability for Native Hawaiians to trust government? I was excited this? that Trisha Watson and yesterday in person, Uncle Walter Ritty from Molokai, said it's time to go from marching to voting. And I've always said time and again, what's missing in the Hawaiian community is political muscularity. They've got to run for office, they've got to get at the table, get the vote, and then the self-determination will follow. And on that note, Rep. Ward, thank you for joining us this morning. Again, to the folks at home, thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next week. In the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at High House GOP.